Hi, this is Jason Harrington, and I want to talk about this last question, which I think is going to be pretty fun. Hopefully you guys found it neat and you actually figured out what the picture was. I'm going to use matplot, pileplot as PLT, like normal, and then I import this strange new thing called random that I use. Now, if you look at the code, I first initialize a starting point at 0, 0, where 0 is the x value and 0 is the y value, and then I say, okay, what's the next point? I say I take the take a point and then I pick a number. Now the number here looks like it's going to be 0, 1, and then this else, this last case, would probably be a 2. Now if we actually look at what the code is doing, it says for i, or sorry, for t in range of 500,000, that's how many I did for this particular example. The test was a little bit less so that your home computer or even your cell phone could actually do it. But if you want to get a really good sharp image, you want to do 500,000 or a million points. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say take n to be a random integer between 0 and 1. So that picks out 0, 1, or 2. Then the next point is the previous point. That's what the negative 1 is doing. And then I put in that number that I have randomly drawn between 0, 1, and 2. So let's actually draw a picture for this to see how this actually works because um, that's the cool part about this. So we're going to have three points, obviously, because we're going to draw our three points that we have here as our triangle. Now the first point is going to be 0, comma, 0. The second point here will just be 1, comma, 0. And this last point here is going to be 1 half, comma, the square root of 3. Now obviously this doesn't make an isosceles triangle, the, but that's okay. Um, if you want to make an isosceles triangle, you can actually take this one term right here, divide it by two. That's technically what the Sierpinski triangle is if you use uh, Sierpinski. And you would see that over here in this step, but I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so how this runs is we have three numbers to choose from randomly, zero, one, or two. And let's see how this actually works. So. If I roll, of course, obviously we start at 0, 0. That's where we start. And suppose in the next step, I roll a 1. Well, let's see what the 1 does. If I come over here to 1, what this is saying is this is the average between the last point and the point 1, 0. And I don't want to take the whole length. I just want to take the half point between the two. So if I roll a 1, then this point goes here. It's literally the length between 0 and 1, but then divide it by 2. Now, if I draw a, if I roll the dice again, I get a 2. And what happens there, if I draw a 2, as you guessed it, this is going to be the point halfway between these two guys. And I take the average of the two. So I'm going to take this point. I'm going to say this point plus a half divided by two, which is going to give me one fourth. And then I'm going to pick the square root of three, add that to this point, which the height is zero. And I'm going to get square root of three over two, which is this point that I'm highlighting there. Now, if I roll a die again, and let's suppose I pick zero. This just says to have each one, but really what I'm doing there is that's the distance between these two, or that's the line between those two, and I pick half of that point. And then if I say, let's roll, uh, now let's say let's roll a two again, then it's going to be half of that point, which is right there. And if you do that for a long enough time, you're going to see a pattern. Now, obviously, you don't want to do this by hand. Also, I want to say there's many different answers for this little guy here. What this says here is that it's going to make uh, a blue plus, a, a blue really small plus, every time there's a little point down. I didn't use dots. That's okay. Some of you used B0 or BO. Um, that's fine. That'll give you a, a dot. Um, there's all kinds of different notation and different things you can use. I want to see if anybody actually used a little up triangle maybe to put the, that would be B hat. So, but any one of those is actually a, a good answer, as long as you can generate the image. 
All right, so this is the beast that you had to generate for your exam. Obviously, it didn't have uh, 500,000 points. It was a very small number, so your computer can do it. But here's what you want to check out about this. If you pick anything, if I pick, let's say, any triangle in there, if I pick this as my triangle, and I blow it up, I get a smaller version of itself. How cool is that? And that's true for anything that I pick, any triangle that I pick. If I were to pick this little itty bitty little one right here and blew it up, and I had, say, 100 million points, then I would get yet another Sierpinski triangle. Now the question I want to pose is, to this thing, what is the dimension? So what is the dimension? This is actually a fractal that I talked about before, and hopefully you remember what that is. So recall, if I make a square, and let's say I shrink it by a factor of a third, one, two, so I break up the bottom this way, you'll notice that if I break it up into thirds, there's going to be nine. So I'm going to have a scaling factor. So scaling, that's the scaling factor. And then that's going to be equal to the number of squares I have. And whatever pops out, that's going to be the little dimension there. That's the Hausdorff dimension. Hausdorff dimension. And n is, of course, the number of times it pieces it fits. So that's the number of pieces. Number of its small number of cells that was scaled down. So number of components. And in this example with the square, obviously we know what the dimension of a square is. If I shrink it down by a third and I make a little square that's a third, then obviously it fits in there nine times. So I'm going to scale it by a, a third. The number of pieces is nine. And I get this nice little square that tells me the dimension. So that means that the dimension is equal to two, completely two dimensions. Now, for the triangle example, it's very similar, not very, doesn't, nothing really changes. But for this, what you have is, um, for our triangle, is you're going to have a scaling factor. Now, the question is, what is the scaling factor? So, the scaling factor, right there. What I'm going to do is, again, you can partition it any way. See, if I, if I partition it, if I break it down into fourths, then it would fit in there one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So if the scaling factor was S is equal to a fourth of its original size, and the number of pieces was equal to nine, then the dimension of this would be, you would have four to the D equals two, nine. And if you want to solve that, just use a simple logarithm and you're going to get D times the natural log of four is equal to the natural log of nine. So that D is going to be equal to the natural log of nine divided by the natural log of four. And according to my handy dandy calculator that I have with me, that's going to be equal to 1.58496 dot dot dot. Now what's interesting about fractals is that, um, let me erase this. Some of you may say, well gee, I didn't quite see that division by four. Maybe you saw the bigger one, right? Maybe you look at this and you said, okay, I'm going to split it in half. And I'm going to count three of them. One, two, three. Ah, ah, ah. Couldn't help myself. I like counting. So, in that case, you would think you'd get a different answer. But you don't. You actually get the same thing. See, if, I, if my shrinking factor was two and the number of pieces was three, then I would get that, whoops, right here then I would get that two to the D is equal to three 
So that means that d is equal to the natural log of 3 divided by the natural log of 2, which is exactly the same value for that. Isn't that cool? Now that's really cool because no matter how you count the pieces and no matter how you subdivide it, you'll always get the same dimension, which makes sense. Dimension shouldn't change. So you can actually take my program now and then you can modify it, maybe put four points, see what happens. You can it now be what's called a Sierpinski carpet. And you can Google these things and see these really cool zoom-ins where they zoom in forever. And the other thing neat that's about it is, unlike calculus, remember in calculus when you zoom in, it turns everything, all the functions turn into a line, right? If you zoom into the sine of x at zero, it looks like y equals x. With fractals though, no matter how much you zoom in, it comes, becomes more and more complex. So you should probably go out and Google some things like Mandelbrot zoom in or fractal zoom in and you'll see a whole bunch of wild things happen. Well, I hope you liked it as much as I did.